what's the difference between ESG and sustainable investing? They, they sound fairly similar. What, how do you distinguish between the two? Quite often, ESG funds or ESG investment funds are more focused on that risk side. So taking out like um, harmful activities like tobacco and gambling um, and managing ESG related factors in investment. They do often or quite often include things like company engagement. They can include positive screens as well or be very focused on ethical investing. Um, but where sustainable investing is you know, different in our perspective and certainly on the RIA scale is sustainable investing is about opportunities and about delivering positive benefits. Um, and they have two different classifications for that. The first is sustainably themed investing. And the second is impact investing. So impact investing is sort of new and emerging and the new kind of shiny sustainable investment approach. And it's really about setting very clear objectives on what the outcomes um, are targeted at from a sustainable perspective. So for example, you might find a fund that's structured around increasing water use and access in Pacific Island nations, for example. Um, and an impact fund would have very strict requirements on how they measure that and how they disclose. Where Alfinity sits is kind of all along that scale. So for our core funds, we uh, use ESG integration. Um, we do use some negative screens. So we exclude thermal coal producers across all of our funds. So that's our core funds as well as our sustainable funds. And we also obviously actively engage with the companies that we manage. So we define our kind of sustainable strategies using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as the way to look at companies that are doing good or for, to help us identify companies that are doing good and delivering positive outcomes. We don't classify ourselves as impact funds and this is important because we aren't targeting one specific goal or one specific outcome across those UN SDGs. As long as a company uh, provides a net positive benefit to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals across any of those goals, and they have strong ESG management practices in place, then we think that they are suitable for our fund. Hmm. And there are a lot of ESG frameworks out there. Why have you chosen the Sustainable Development Goals as the framework for these funds? Yeah, so we use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a framework to sort of clearly identify companies that are doing good. Um, and therefore, as a way to define our universe for our sustainable strategies. So we believe that they are the best um, way for us to define a sustainable investable universe because the UN SDGs are a globally recognised framework. So they were ratified in 2017. Um, all United Nations have agreed to meet these set of goals by 2030. And they also cover a really wide range of environmental and social areas. So they cover things like no poverty, they cover areas like climate action. There's goals in there around sustainable cities and industry, which is very important. So it's not you know, entirely targeted on you know, just the environment side or just the social side. They're very holistic. Um, and they also have a really clear set of objectives. And again, we think this is very important because underneath the 17 goals, there's 169 individual targets. So when we are looking at how companies contribute to those goals or how they provide positive outcomes, we're very much looking at the alignment of the companies with the indicators as well as the goals. And that allows us to do that with less interpretation and in a much more rigorous way. I was going to say some of the goals that you mentioned there um, can be a little bit amb ambiguous. So can you give us an example of how you've applied that in your fund? Yeah, so we, we look uh, very closely at company revenue alignment with the goals. So we have a, a specific methodology to define how a company addresses the goals. So the first thing that we do is look at the revenue breakdown for the stock that we might be um, assessing. And then we determine whether that uh, each line of those revenues have a positive and or negative contribution with the goals. And again, this is something that, um, you know, we think is important to our process that we look at the positive and negative alignment uh, to do with the goals. So it's not just about finding companies that uh, contribute in a positive way. We acknowledge that uh, it's actually very hard to find a perfect company that doesn't have any negatives associated with it. And so we measure the positive and negative, and then we net 
the outcome. So the methodology that we apply looks at the revenues and then we assign those various revenues across the goals. We also look really closely at ESG management as well. So the operational management practices of various businesses, but that doesn't necessarily come into our sort of SDG um, assessment mm -hmm. framework. I'm curious, um, you know, you've spoken before about examples of companies that are perhaps trying to um, solve one of the goals around world hunger, and they do that through a sustainable food, you know, and produce and agriculture process. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I think that that really brings it to life. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, there's lots of different companies that align with the various goals. So I'll give you a couple of examples and then talk about one in a little bit more detail. So, you know, if we look at, um, say, SDG in 11 or SDG 9, which is sustainable cities and infrastructure and innovation, you know, for example, we own um, a company called Fortescue Metals Group or FMG, which is um, a ticker. And obviously they mine iron ore, which is needed for things like electric vehicles and resilient cities which positively contribute to SDG 11 and SDG 9. Um, there's also to do with Fortescue, they also have you know, negative alignment associated with things like SDG 13, which is climate action for embodied emissions. Um, and then we look at the ESG management or their, their sort of um, you know, health and safety measures, how they manage operational water use on site, um, heritage management, which is obviously very topical, et cetera. And we engage really closely with them to address issues and understand the strength of their management practices. Um, a second example to provide is, yeah, Costa Group, which is an Australian fresh food provider. And we also um, invest in Nomad Foods, which is a UK based business that sells uh, frozen fish. So both of those companies are really good examples of aligning with SDG2, which is zero hunger. Um, and the reason that both of them provide opportunities in zero hunger is because um, Costa obviously provides fresh fruit and vegetables to the Australian marketplace. And then Nomad Foods provides, you know, healthy and fresh food, um, which is frozen fish and frozen vegetables predominantly um, all year round into the UK and they reduce waste in the home. Mm. With both of those companies, what we look at very, very closely is their supply chains, because we know that, say with Nomad, um, selling fish, you know, responsible fishing and responsible sourcing of fish is really important. So we, you know, made sure that 100% of their fish is um, certified by the appropriate body in the UK, that they do audits of those requirements. And similar for Costa, you know, we're looking at their use of um, labour hire workforces, backpackers, not so much at the moment, but backpackers and, and things like that. So there's sort of a, a two-step process there or a filtration process where, whereby you take the entire investable universe, filter it down to these really strong, you know, ESG and sustainable development goals companies. And then from there, it goes into your investment team to kind of put a bit of a, um, an analysis over the top of that as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we also, um, I should mention, we also do apply a number of exclusions. So we exclude um, all, all fossil fuel producers from the investable universe um, on sustainable. We also exclude other sort of typical industries like weapons and gambling and tobacco um, because they are incongruent with achieving the SDGs and they, they go against actually achieving the SDGs. Um, but yes, that's right. You know, we, we do um, start for the Australian, we start at the ASX 300 and then we get down to about 180 companies by the time we apply the exclusions as well as the SDG analysis. Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Um, last question on this one. Um, what happens if a company can't meet those SDG goals or, you know, what is the process by which you um, either actively manage that or discuss that or, or reach that uh, end decision? Yeah, um, so there's two possible reasons that a company might not fit um, the sustainable fund or the sustainable universe. One will be on the SDG analysis or another might be on the ESG side. So if a company has, like I mentioned, if a company has strong sustainable alignment but has very weak um, ESG management practices, it would not be suitable and vice versa. If you have very weak sustainable alignment but very strong ESG management practices, it would not be suitable. 
Um, an example of a company that sort of meets one and not the other and isn't necessarily a bad company uh, is Amcor. So Amcor uh, manufactures plastic containers and we actually own Amcor in our core funds. So in our core and our concentrated Australian funds, um, we introduced Amcor uh, not that long ago, I think about six months ago. And we did, you know, quite thorough uh, due diligence on their ESG management practices and, and understanding um, how they, you know, manage things like emissions and waste, obviously, and the use of uh, virgin plastics. We were comfortable that they are good operators. They've got good governance practices in place. We think their ESG reporting was very strong and having spoke to company management a number of times, we're, we're comfortable that, you know, they, they meet our ESG criteria for our core. But when we looked at them in the context of the sustainable fund, although um, they, there is some benefit in um, plastic packaging, so, you know, greater food freshness in the fridge, for example, making food last longer, uh, it was very hard to ignore the fact that um, uh, as of today, about 90% of the plastic that goes into making um, their products is from virgin. So it's only about 10% of the plastics that go into their um, packaging and their containers is actually made from recycled plastic resin. And that for us was, you know, the tipping point, I guess, between whether that company is essentially doing something good or not. If we had have looked at those numbers and, for example, 60% of, you know, the plastic that they used or the resin that they used uh, was made from recycled plastics, it probably would have been a different discussion. Um, mm -hmm. And we also couldn't see on their behalf any clear targets to actually increase that number. So we also couldn't look at it and say, well, you know, in the 10 years time or in five years time, we're going to see that number increase to 50% and then it's going to increase to 70 and we can see they're doing all of this work. Um, so without those things, you know, we, we really couldn't get comfortable that they would be appropriate for sustainable, um, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily, you know, a hard exclusion either, like a fossil fuel producer is a hard exclusion and we would never consider it, whereas Amcor, you know, we will keep a close eye and as they progress, we may make mm -hmm. a decision for them to come into the universe.